And uh, before I introduce our, our, our speaker today, I'd like to just uh, uh, give you the big news from our center, the Sassan Center for Sustainable Management. Just last month, we, uh, Simon Henry Yu, um, formerly partnering with CSR Asia um, in our various operations. So you'll see more of these kind of events, um, kind of training, um, program of things that we'll be doing together um, between SASIN and CSR Asia. Um, and this is uh, one of the, it's actually the second, we did an SROI workshop um, a few weeks ago. And uh, we're following this up with uh, the GRI um, workshop. We also have, uh, following up uh, with this, a uh, full day GRI program if you're interested um, in what Richard has to offer today. Right. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Richard Walker, who is uh, the, one of the founders of CSR Asia and also the chairman of CSR Asia. Um, CSR Asia is the largest consultancy in the, in the field of CSR sustainability in Asia, with lo locations in nine, nine cities um, across Asia. Um, and uh, they have huge, uh, vast experience in GRI um, reporting. And uh, so we're very fortunate to have Richard here with us. Um, and uh, without further ado, please a very warm welcome to Professor Richard. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, Thanks very much, Nick. Um, as Nick said, CSR Asia has offices around the region. I'm actually based in Hong Kong, uh, but I get to travel around a lot. And uh, our presence here in Bangkok is uh, cemented in this new partnership that we have with Nick Center and the, and the business school here. We're, sort of, we're very pleased to sort of be working together on sustainability and, and CSR issues going forward. Uh, so. Uh, what we want to do this afternoon for the next almost two hours uh, is talk about the Global Reporting Initiative reporting framework uh, and particularly talk about this concept of materiality. Um, my approach to reporting is, is very strategic. Um, and I, one of the first things I say to companies is that you know, if your intention is to simply produce a report, we don't really want to work with you. Uh, because it has to be a lot more than that. I think the report has to be part of a much, much bigger process uh, uh, around your sustainability strategy. Uh, CSR Asia has been going around 12 years, and reporting is something we've done right from the very start. So I was wondering how many reports we've actually done for companies over the last 12 years. And I think it's, it must be well in excess of 100 reports uh, that we've actually produced for, uh, for different companies. Um, all in Asia, it has to be said, we only operate in Asia, that's our sort of expertise and what differentiates us, us, us from, uh, from our competitors back in Europe and, and America. Um, so what I want to do this afternoon is, is three things really. One, deal with the context of reporting, which is basically to ask the question, why should we report? Um, what's the benefits? Um, uh, what is the context of reporting? Because Many of your companies may be in a position where actually you are now being forced to report. You, you actually have no choice. Uh, and that's, a, that's very much a trend we're seeing across the world, uh, including here in, in Asia. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative G4 version. So we're on the fourth iteration, actually the fifth to be honest, but, but that doesn't matter, I'll explain that. Uh, we're actually on the fifth iteration of, 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 of GRI. And I think this latest version of GRI um, has been uh, pushing us all in the direction of being much, much more strategic. Uh, and, and I think that the G4 is, is, is by far the best version so far, um, because one of its messages is that you need to think very carefully about what you are putting into your report, because the last thing you should be doing is reporting on everything. If you report on absolutely everything, then we will read it because it would be a terribly, terribly boring report. Um, and so GRI very much pushes us down this road of what we call materiality. And that's the third thing I'll talk about, is what is materiality, uh, and how do you define materiality with your stakeholders, 
uh, and what does that imply for, for what your report looks like as we go forward. Um, I'm very happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, so if you have, um, if I say things you're not clear about, if you have questions, if you have comments, I'm more than happy for you to just sort of interrupt me and uh, we'll see how that goes. If we start getting a bit too behind time, I'll just tell you to be quiet. Um, so if you, if you want to ask anything, then that's, that, 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 that's fine. Okay, so let's start off with the context, which is really answering the question, you know, why should you be reporting? Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there is real value in reporting. Um, and that this is part of your sustainability or CSR and therefore this is part of your brand and your reputation and the trust uh, that people have in your business. This uh, survey here done by Boston College and Ernst & Young uh, basically asks the question um, how, do, how does reporting actually add value to your company? And this is a sort of uh, a survey of stakeholders who are interested in reporting. And you can see improved reputation um, is one of those uh, aspects. You know, people are increasingly interested in your performance around sustainability or social responsibility. And you know, this document basically should lay out your commitments and your performance uh, in terms of sustainability or CSR. Increased employee loyalty. We know that people want to work for companies that they trust. We know that one of the stakeholder groups that often read sustainability reports are not only employees, but prospective employees as well. So people are looking for information about your company, and this is where they can, they can find it. The third uh, reason is about reducing inaccurate information about your company. Um, look, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. That's, that's the message I, 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 I give to businesses. If you don't put your version of your sustainability performance out there in the open, people will start making up stories about you. So it's very important, I think, that you are out there with transparent, honest information about your sustainability performance, which includes what you do well, but for credibility's sake, it probably includes what you don't do so well as well. And that's a very important aspect of reporting as well. You can't just tell the good news. If you just tell me what a wonderful company you are, I don't believe you anyway, because none of us are perfect. Uh, I need to know what you don't do so well and what you're going to be doing to try and improve that poorer performance. And therefore, the fourth uh, issue is the sort of, the, the role of the report in, re in, in refining your vision and your strategy and, and, and those sorts of things. Increased consumer loyalty, well, you can actually read the list for yourself. It's all there. I mean, there are lots and lots of different ways, there are lots and lots of different reasons for you, uh, for you to report. Um, but as I said before, for me, one of the key issues is that if you're going to report, it has to be credible. Um, it's no good you producing a sort of 10-page PR brochure. Because when I look at a sustainability report, I am not looking for PR. I'm looking, at, I'm looking for an accurate message about how you are performing. Uh, and you should base that around what your stakeholders think are important. The issues that your stakeholders think are important is what you should be reporting on. And so one of the first things you want to have in a report is a thorough stakeholder engagement process. And I'm going to come back to this because this is, at the, 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 this is at the foundation of materiality, is finding out what your stakeholders are, are, are interested in. Secondly, I want to see the link between your report and your business strategy. I want to see that your, 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 your business strategy has sustainability as part of it. Uh, and so the report shouldn't be a sort of something that you do at the end of the process, it should be embedded into your strategic process uh, generally. I want to see a, the publication of targets and results. Uh, I hate reports that are simple descriptions. Descriptions mean nothing to me. I want to know what your target is for reducing your CO2 emissions. I want to know what your target is for reducing your water consumption. I want to know what your target is for promoting women into the workplace. Um, 
all these sorts of things are things I want to see in your report. I want to see you set targets, and I want you to tell me whether you met those targets or not. And if you did, that's great. And if you didn't, tell me, and tell me why, and tell me what you're going to do about uh, attaining those targets in the future. And last but not least, something that I say to my clients all the time, but a lot of the time they don't want to listen to me, is that unless you tell me the bad news as well as the good news, you will have no credibility. So you've got to tell me not only the things you do well, but the things that you struggle with as well. You know, why didn't you hit that CO2 reduction target, for example, last year, if that was the case? Give me, give me a reason why you failed to meet your targets. For me, that gives you credibility. You know, I feel better about a company that says, here's my target, I didn't attain it, and this is why, than a company that only tells me the good news. A company that covers up the targets by you know, not reporting on them because they didn't need them. So you know, that balance of good and bad is really, really uh, important uh, as, as, as well. So for me, as I said before, the reporting process that is part of your strategy. And I, I, I want to emphasize that it's the reporting process. This is not a one-off thing. Uh, as soon as your report is actually published, you should be thinking about your next report. If you like, it's a, it's a cycle of continuous improvement. Hopefully, each report is going to get better and better and, 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 and better. Um, it's part of your brand. It's part of your reputation. It should be part of your decision-making process uh, as well. And in an ideal world, the process of reporting will lead to organizational development as well. As you report more, you'll start to think about what else your organization needs. If you're committed to having significant reductions in carbon dioxide, which hopefully most companies are, maybe at some point we're going to need a function within the business looking at that. Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that emerge from the reporting uh, process. Ultimately, though, this should be driving better performance. As I said, this should be about continuous improvement. Uh, this exercise in reporting, measuring and reporting, and talking about what you did well and what you did not do well, should be part of your performance metrics going forward. And some companies have started linking that performance directly into the bonuses of their senior management. And that's something you can think about uh, in the future uh, uh, as well. Stakeholder engagement is key to this, absolutely key. And at the end of the day, you'll see later that investors are wanting to see this increasingly. Uh, over half of the managed funds in countries like the United <coughs> Kingdom now are essentially socially responsible. Uh, something like 60% of all managed funds in the United Kingdom have some sort of uh, environmental, social, governance, ethical criteria uh, attached to them, particularly the big pension funds, uh, of course. So the key drivers of sustainability reporting is on the one hand dealing with risks, um, making sure that you manage those risks, and there's nothing like a reporting process to highlight where the possible risks are so that you can stay out of trouble. Companies also don't want to stay, uh, don't want to be seen as laggards, they don't want to fall behind. And I think the reporting process actually helps you preempt some of the risks as well. Because the reporting process makes you think about some of the most important issues in your, in your organization. And it makes you think about how you don't cause, uh, cause, cause problems. But this is also about creating value. Um, managing risks is fine, but I think having a good reporting process is also part of your competitive advantage. It's about saying, look at us, we're trying really, really hard, we are differentiating our brand, our products from uh, our competitors uh, by being sustainable, by thinking about social uh, responsibility, and it helps us to, to attract investment. And what that means at the end of the day is that you are meeting the expectations of stakeholders. Uh, and for me, a report is a really important bridge between your company and your stakeholders. It's that, it's, it's that form of communications between what your stakeholders want to see within your organization and, and, and the performance uh, of your organization. 
the reality is uh, that if you're not reporting already, it's highly likely that if you don't do this on a voluntary basis, you're going to have to do this uh, anyway. Um, regulators are pushing ESG, environmental, social, and governance uh, reporting. Um, we are seeing regulators imposing more and more stringent regulations or at least recommendations on, on companies. Over the last five or six years, we've seen a major increase in regulations around governance, um, and that is still expanding. Uh, some aspects of governance being made mandatory, other having strong recommendations. In Hong Kong, um, where I am based, for example, the regulator has just announced a recommendation that 30% of your board should be women, uh, for example. So you know, sometimes it's hard regulation, sometimes it's just recommendations that you are encouraged to, to, to follow. But stock exchanges around the region are now often mandating uh, on some form of ESG, environmental, social, governance type of reporting. So, uh, some degree of ESG reporting is now required uh, in Malaysia, uh, China, Indonesia, and Taiwan. Uh, and in Hong Kong and Singapore, the stock exchange has basically said, either report, in other words, comply with our uh, request for you to report according to some uh, laid out guidelines, or explain why you are not reporting. Uh, so from this year, for example, in Hong Kong, where I'm based, you either have to produce a report, or you have to explain to your shareholders why, why you are not producing a report, which, to be honest, doesn't look good. And when I'm not producing a report because, well, actually, I can't think of a single good reason for not producing a report, so that's going to look, look, look rather weak uh, in, in actual fact. So stock exchanges in Asia have been a, a major, major push, and we're going to see more of this type of uh, development in the future, including here in Thailand, uh, I suspect. Uh, and the other thing that's been driving um, ESG reporting has been the growth of sustainability uh, indices. Um, not only big sustainability indices like the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, but more local ones as well. So in Hong Kong, we have a Hang Seng Sustainability Index. Uh, in Shanghai, there is a Sustainable Development Index in the Shanghai Stock Exchange, the SSE. And so these sorts of things are also, although they're not mandatory, they are encouraging companies to report on their environmental, social, and governance issues because there are benefits to being in these indices. Because there are some investors who will buy your stock because you're in these indices. So you know, it, it can only have a positive impact on your share price to be included in these sustainability indices if there are some shareholders who, who buy your stock on that basis. So right now they are still not fully compliant. In, 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 in your markets, selected markets that you mentioned, right? Who's not in compliance? Well, they, they, they haven't, in, in your example, none of these markets enforce the compliance. Uh, but they will do very soon. Right, right, that's what um, I mean. So in Taiwan, yes. now, there is mandatory reporting. So if you are a listed company and you do not produce a report, you can be fined, and, and well, I, it, 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 you could be delisted. I mean, it, it, you will not be complying with the rules of the stock exchange if you don't do this. Hong Kong and Singapore give you the option of saying, I will either report I will, or I will tell you why I'm not reporting. So that's a slightly weaker version. Um, so you will, I mean, if you're in, if, if you're basically, basically, if you're in any of these markets here, if you're listed in any of these markets here, Essentially, you need to report. Otherwise, it looks pretty bad, uh, to, to, to be honest. So th th this is this is I mean this is the direction of travel basically. Um, ultimately, really, you're going to have no choice. So my advice is get on with it now. You may you may as well make a start in in in, 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 in the, in the, in the uh, in, in process now. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, investors. Investors are, are, are very important stakeholders. They are your owners. 
Uh, and you can see the data I was referring to earlier. 70% um, of institutional investors are now turning down projects on the grounds of being worried about certain environmental, social, and governance risks. These are real risks. I mean, they are really tangible risks. Um, the most cited example, I think, of a risk is a company called Foxconn. Many of you will know that Foxconn is one of the biggest makers of Apple, Apple products, particularly the iPhone. And about three years ago, they actually had some worker suicides. They actually had workers who were so stressed at work that they jumped off the top of buildings. Um, shareholders were so worried that Apple would cancel contracts with Foxconn, by the way, in the end they didn't, but even the worry that Apple would cancel contracts with Foxconn, that led to a 70% decrease in share price. So that's, you know, that, that's what investors are really worried about, that you could actually lose business and share prices can plunge because of environmental disasters, uh, social conflict, labor conflict, poor governance, including things like bribery and corruption, uh, of course. But on the other hand, on the more positive side, there are trillions of dollars now invested in companies that do have some sort of environmental, social governance type of, type of profile. Um, almost 60% of, of, of managed assets in the whole of Europe in 2014 had some sort of element of social responsibility uh, uh, within them. And the growth of SRI assets between 2012 and 2014 has been anything from about one third to three quarters. So you know, investors are demanding this. Investors want to see that. And we know that because we work with some of these investors um, who are increasingly demanding that companies are thinking about these environmental, social, and, and, and governance risks. And the whole point of telling you that is that what investors are looking for is some numbers and some data, and, 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 and they want to be convinced that you do have a strategy for dealing with some of these environmental, social, and governance uh, issues that they are, they are concerned about. So again, you know, I think you have no choice. Uh, stock exchanges, regulators are pushing you, Clearly, investors are demanding this, particularly long-term investors. Short-term investors don't care. You know, Short-term short investors are just looking for quick wins on a speculative model. But long-term investors, particularly pension funds, those people who want to hold your stock for the longer term, these guys are really, really interested in what you're doing in terms of uh, social responsibility. I would uh, highlight a, a, a few illustrations of some of the points I've been making. I think um, I can do that best by looking at uh, a few companies, uh, and not all of these are Asian, some of them are Asian, some of them are not. Uh, but this is one of the best property developers in the world, I think, uh, British land. Um, and one of the things that they are clearly uh, able to show is performance against targets. So, so one of the things that you must always think about when you're reporting is, okay, what are your targets going forward? Because I don't want your report only to be an account of history. I don't, I don't want you only to talk about the past. I also want you to talk about the future. So yes, tell me what your past performance was like, but then tell me what your future vision is through a series of, of, of targets. And then tell me whether you achieved them or, or, or not. So here's British land's environmental targets, for example, uh, a, a commitment to reduce carbon emissions between 2009 and 2015 by 40%, which is actually a very, very bold, ambitious target. Uh, and they met, they got to 39%, which I, I think is pretty good. They were 1% short uh, of, that, of that overall target. Uh, and they talked about that, and they talked about how many tons of carbon that, 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 that is saving. But they also put it into sort of lay person's terms as well. So they said, you know, we save 52,600 tons of carbon. Well, actually, I have no idea what 52,600 tons of carbon looks like. Until they tell me, actually, that's equivalent to annual emissions of 8,000 tons. So that, that, yeah, that gives me a little bit more, a little bit more, more context. Here, a second, a, a different target, 
um, to achieve 40% of less, land, less landlord influence energy. Um, and again, they, they met that 100%. But when it comes to water, you can see that they didn't really meet their target terribly well. So the target was to use 20% less water between 2009 and 2015. And they actually achieved only 14%. It's still, it's still pretty good, um, but they didn't achieve the 20%. But again, they're, they're, they're open and honest about that. And they say, you know, we had a 20% target, we met uh, 14%, and for more details, read our account of why we didn't read the reach the target uh, uh, alone. A second example is a company that we've worked with over the years, uh, Swire Properties uh, in, 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 in Hong Kong. Um, Swire Properties, again, is one of the leading property developers in Hong Kong. They have a lot of interest in China as well, uh, increasingly. And they're a company that's been growing substantially. Uh, a lot of growth. They have retail, they have big shopping malls, they have offices, they have residential, they have a whole suite uh, of, uh, of different types of, of buildings. And you can see that uh, between 2001 and 2015, uh, they've steadily been increasing uh, the uh, square foot that they are managing and that they are, that, that, that they are developing. Um, and the nice thing about this graph is that as it shows that as the gross floor area has been increasing substantially for the company, the annual energy consumption has gone in completely the opposite direction. I mean, that's something of an achievement when you're, the, the size of your developments are growing, but your annual energy consumption has been going uh, steadily down and down and down. So you've got a 16.7% you've increase in your size of developments, uh, but at the same time, your energy reduction during the same period of time is reduced by 13.1%. Equivalent to 341 million Hong Kong dollars. That's about 40 million US dollars. That's, that's quite a lot of savings uh, just by having uh, energy uh, and, and energy efficiency. And they've done this by just being really innovative, um, trying things out, um, changing things like chillers, which for most properties in Hong Kong is the major source of energy because it's, it's too hot and humid. Um, changing lighting, uh, but also experimenting with things like solar uh, and even uh, small-scale wind turbines, although actually small-scale wind turbines don't work terribly well in, in, in Hong Kong, but um, other things do. But at least they've been, they've been experimenting. Supply chains, huge, huge issue, uh, particularly if you're in the, the garment industry, the textile industry, uh, labor issues, uh, water issues, energy issues. Uh, here's a company that I think has done some, some great stuff with its supply chains, Patagonia. Um, very interesting company in many, many ways. Um, but you know, they are showing you clearly where they have operations in terms of textile mills, in terms of factories, uh, and even, even you're able to track uh, the farms that they are sourcing, sourcing some of their cotton for. Uh, from example. And all of these examples you can go online and have a look at for yourself. Um, they're, all, they're all there. Uh, this, the Swire Properties report is, is particularly good, I think, because they've got a lot of really, really tangible numbers that shows that you, know, you can make money out of being uh, environmentally uh, responsible. Uh, and last but not least, Unilever, again, uh, a, a company that does really, really great reporting. Um, and sets itself some really, really challenging targets to um, improving health and well-being for more than a billion people, reducing environmental impact by a half, and enhancing livelihoods for millions of people across the world. Sorry, that was the point I was going to ask that then tangible you know, battle. Uh, all the examples are either uh, tangible and you can see the number and measure the number, but I took a note on the, on the first slide that the British land. How could you, uh, is that the reason that you have the audit by PwC? Yes. Is it, is it, is it, is it uh, compliance in, the, in Britain? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I think, I think um, 
assurance undertaking by people like PwC just gives you that added level of transparency. That says, actually, we didn't make these numbers up. You know, here, are our real, here are our numbers, and by the way, um, we got them audited by a third party company like, 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 like PwC. So this is not Volkswagen. Just that's the observation I, I have. A lot, of, a lot more companies are preparing the GRIs and China, and all these numbers are, are, are somewhat uh, preparing the same fashion, but we've never heard of the audit. No, I mean, a lot of companies are, are, are choosing to do that, um, particularly the bigger ones, just, just because investors like it. So, I mean, you know, uh, to be assured, you know, to have your numbers checked out. I think it gives you that added level of confidence. Nobody says you have to. And I know the stock exchange indices are currently saying that you have to have your data verified or your report assured. Um, but it's, I think it, it, it's a trend that we have, have been seeing. Um, and, it's, and it's good business for those companies that do assurance in, 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 in many cases. Um, so going back to Unilever again, uh, again, you can have a look at this on their website, it's a bit small here, but I just wanted to illustrate the sort of emphasis that Unilever puts on targets. Tangible targets, and, and talking about when they've met them, when they haven't met them. Um, you know, and as a one page, one of the things I, I want to talk about later is actually how you report. Um, you know, this is a nice one page summary of what Unilever is doing. There is, I think, a problem increasingly with reports, and that is that people are not reading them. Put your hand up if you've actually read a report from cover to cover this year. Okay. Not a single person, I think Nick has. <laughs> but, but this is illustrating one of the issues I think we have, is that as we get more and more and more reports, fewer and fewer and fewer of them are going to get read, and I don't have time to read every report that is published in Hong Kong, I just simply don't. But a one-page infographic like that, well, that's the sort of stuff I can sort of send to my friends on WhatsApp or Instagram or I can post on Facebook. And you know, we all know that under 30 year olds don't read anything much these days. They want their sort of one-page sort of infographics, and, and, and that's the sort of that's something we have to think about. So when I'm talking about reporting, I don't necessarily mean a report that has to start on page one and end on page 100. I think we're seeing lots of variations of that beginning to beginning to happen now, including a nice sort of summary of everything we do on a on a single graphic, uh, for example. Uh, and then, again, this is another illustration I like. This is this is Heathrow Airport. Um, again, you know, it, it's an interesting graphic that tells you about the different types of emissions, where they're happening on landing, on takeoff. Uh, within the building itself, for example, at Heathrow Airport. Again, this is on their website. You can go and have a look. It's an interesting way of sort of telling a story about an airport, because the vast majority of emissions coming from an airport actually don't even come from the airport. They come from your customers, which are the airlines. Uh, and, and so telling a story around how you manage not only your own emissions, but the emissions from companies you don't even own, but companies you can nevertheless influence. That's the sort of the story that you can tell uh, here, uh, here as well, uh, for example. So as I, 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 I this is not big enough, but 45% of the emissions from Heathrow Airport are not under the direct control of the airport at all. They can only influence those airlines who are creating the vast majority uh, of, those, uh, of, of those emissions. So you know, when we talk about reporting, therefore, I just want to sort of highlight that it's not only the written word that's important. Um, graphics, diagrams, pictures, all the whole package, I think, is, 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 is really, really important. So before we go on to talk about G4, are there, are there any thoughts or questions about context so far? Yeah. Uh, how about setting up the intangible target, such as Operate image, something like that. Is that acceptable? Yes, uh, much, much more difficult to do. I mean, measuring my water use, measuring my CO2, measuring you know, uh, aspects of my supply chain are, 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 are relatively easy. Intangible things such as do I improve my brand and reputation and image? 
Um, I can include those if I want to, but they're much, much more difficult to actually measure. But a company that, a company that does do that is Unilever. Um, so at Unilever, uh, all the senior management bonuses are based on quite a complex formula. One aspect of that formula is sustainability performance. Um, and one of the ways in which they measure that sustainability performance is perceptions of stakeholders about that performance. So one of the things that Unilever does, does every year is just go out to its stakeholders and say, in your view, do you think our sustainability performance has improved significantly, improved a little bit, not improved or got a lot worse? You know? um, and so those perceptions then go into, partly feed into senior management bonuses actually. So you can do it, but you have to be aware that it's, it's, it's a lot less scientific than, 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 than just measuring environmental performance, for example. But some companies, some companies do do it. Other thoughts, questions, comments? I think I think you've got the right point about perception, simply because it's a, it's a, it is a real issue, especially in those listed companies that finance the provide the UI. Yeah. One of the numbers, tangible number, even tangible ones, they talk about saving a certain certain amount of million baht or whatever. Where is it in the financial report? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a trend in some companies towards trying to integrate the sustainability report with the financial report. And you know, people like Swire, interestingly, people like Swire have gone down the road of integrating their sustainability performance with their financial performance. But for them, it's relatively easy. Um, you know, it's properties, it's very measurable. For other companies, it's a lot more difficult than that. But I mean, it is, it is possible. It is, it is possible to do. Um, but the perception issue, I think, is very important. And I just think that you know, if you think about the big brand name companies in the world, we all have our views about them. You know, whether that's Unilever, or whether it's Nestle, or whether it's Coca-Cola, or whether it's Volkswagen. You know, we, we, we suddenly have perceptions about these companies. And one of, the ways that, you know, one of the ways that these companies communicate with us is through that sustainability report. And I think you know, that is an important part, I think, of their, of their image and the brand and the way they are actually perceived. And I think those big, those big brands are very good at this. You know, those, those big brands are very good at getting the message out there um, through their reporting process. Okay, so let's let's move on to GRI G4. Um, as I said before, Global Reporting Initiative has been around quite a long time now. Um, but the G4 iteration of the Global Reporting Initiative is probably the most comprehensive to date. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this now, but if you're interested in a lot more in-depth stuff, you have to come to the sort of one-day GRI course that we're doing on the 4th of July. Um, GRI is quite difficult to digest. If any of you have seen the GRI guidelines, they run to about 200 pages. Um, so they are extremely detailed and extremely comprehensive. Um, but I'm going to give you a snapshot of what GRI actually means in practice, because uh, I don't think you actually need to read 200 pages to get the sort of basic idea of what, what GRI is, is, is about. So GRI is, it, it, it has become the world's most widely used sustainability reporting framework. It is not the only one, there are others. Um, but I think if you are a global company, a global player, you need to be using this because basically this is what most companies are actually uh, using who have, uh, who have credibility. Uh, and what GRI basically sets out is sort of the principles of reporting, how you should report, but then most importantly perhaps for some companies is the indicators to measure and report against. So this gives you a whole series of, if you like, ideas uh, about what you should report against. It gives you a description of the metrics that you should be reporting against. Now, the first thing I want to say is that there are many, many, many of these indicators, and that does not mean you should report against absolutely everything. Uh, and GRI G4 has been particularly strong on saying, look, just because there's an indicator does not mean you have to report on it. 
you, know, you have to determine whether that indicator is important to your business. Now that's been quite a change from the old version, the previous version, which was G3 or G3.1, which was a sort of minor iteration. Um, because G3 and G3.1 almost encouraged you to report on everything because they had these measures of A, B, and C. Uh, and A meant that you reported on pretty much all core indicators, B meant you reported on some, and C meant you reported on a few. It's very unfortunate that they chose A, B, C, because A, B, C in GRI has nothing to do with quality. But the trouble is, ever since we were at school, when we were five years old, A meant excellent and C meant average, right? So this is firmly embedded in my head, at least. Um, it's unfortunate that they chose A, B, and C because a lot of companies wanted to report on absolutely everything. And what this inadvertently led to was really, really boring reports. Because companies were ticking all the boxes and reporting on absolutely everything. And we had these hundred page reports, which were just so boring. I, mean, I think they should have been an award for the most boring sustainability report in the world. And I could have named a few, I can tell you. Um, G4 basically says, no, that was never our intention. Okay? G4 basically says, what's most important is materiality. What's most important is that you report on the issues that are important to your business, but also the issues that are important to your stakeholders as well. And, and we'll come back to this in a minute, because that is really fundamental now to, to, to the reporting uh, uh, process. So basically, um, the GRI guidelines operate, uh, offer you this sort of international reference point uh, that basically gives you a lot of guidance around issues like governance, how is your company governed, um, how, and what governance structures do you have in place, and does that governance lead to ethical and responsible business decisions. Uh, it gives you a lot of help in defining environmental aspects of what you do, social aspects of what you do, everything from employment practices, labor standards down your supply chain, diversity in the workplace, links with local communities, but also your economic performance as well. Um, and even within the sustainability of the report, I think there should be a link to the in economic contributions that you make to the communities, countries, wherever you, uh, wherever you operate as well. But as I said before, the focus of G4 is to report on what matters and where it matters. And I think immediately, we have to recognize that what matters will vary from industry to industry. And if you're running an airport or flying airplanes, not to report on carbon dioxide emissions would seem to be somewhat odd. Or if you're Coca-Cola or your Pepsi-Cola, not talking about water and your use of water would be somewhat odd. But also, we have to think about different issues in different places. Uh, and so country by country, you will often find different priorities, again, okay, depending on, uh, on, on local situation. Water is a great example of that. Now, in countries where there is water abundance, you may put a lot less emphasis on water issues compared with what we're getting in this part of the world, is countries where there are real water shortages. Uh, so you know, not only industry, but also geographical location is, is important. And what GRI4, GRI G4 basically says is, you know, look at those important issues. Focus it on, on what matters, where it matters, is part of defining what is material. So rather than report on everything, report on what's important uh, and where it's important, uh, of course. And that emphasis really leads you onto this third bullet point here as well. In that, that emphasis forces you to identify what is critical to be managed and what needs to be changed. 
And I think most companies would never claim that they are perfect in dealing with their most material issues, but that they're constantly making progress. They're constantly improving, improving, improving uh, their, uh, their, their performance. So these material topics really lead to your strategic focus, the things you need to think about uh, going, uh, going forward. And GRI gives you a lot of guidance on how to do that. I'm going to simplify that, uh, because actually it's not that difficult. Uh, GRI basically gives you a lot of guidance on how you define materiality and how you set the boundaries as well of, 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 of materiality. You know, that, is a, that is a challenge. Um, G4 basically says that you need to think about what are the boundaries of your organization. And in most cases, defining your organization according to its legal boundaries is probably not good enough. If you look at a company like Adidas, if you define Adidas according to its legal boundaries, you'd have this sort of southern German company, um, which actually didn't have very much impact whatsoever. Because of course, Adidas doesn't do anything except coordinate because everything they make is outsourced. Um, so defining a company according to its legal boundaries when you're a large outsourced footwear and clothing company makes no sense whatsoever because the biggest impact you have is along your supply chains uh, into places like China and Bangladesh and Pakistan and South America where you're actually making your products. So boundaries are important. Uh, how, you define, how, you, how you define your company is actually really, really uh, important. But the whole emphasis of GR, GRI G4 is to say, think about materiality, think about boundaries, so that your report becomes strategic and useful to stakeholders, uh, basically, and that your, your report is sort of credible to the people who are, who are, who are using, your, uh, using your report. So the value of, of, of GRI is firstly we have this common language. And I think that's very, very useful because uh, not least it allows us to benchmark uh, between companies. Um, and, and that's something you know, increasingly we get asked to do a lot of, uh, particularly when companies are starting out on their sustainability strategy. They want to know how their competitors are doing and how their, their peer organizations are doing. So that, that common language really, really helps. The second thing is that GRI didn't come from nowhere. Um, the GRI G4 process, for example, took about three years because GRI is really a, a multi-stakeholder initiative. I mean, it, it is, it, it, there is a legal entity called the GRI based in Amsterdam. Uh, but GRI is really much bigger than that. Uh, and it is a multi-stakeholder consensus, and G the, the whole process of creating GRI originally and creating the latest G4 version involved lots and lots of different stakeholders from around the world. So we had, had labor NGOs talking about supply chain issues and outsourced factories. We had environmental NGOs talking about climate change and water and, and those sorts of things. We had legal experts talking about board composition and talking about you know, how you manage a company in a way that avoids bribery and corruption. Uh, all, those, all those sorts of things are brought together in, 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 one, in one organization, in one, one framework. And that gives it credibility. Uh, you know, I, I, I say to my clients, you know, use GRI, because that gives you a degree of credibility. Um, but a lot of the local stock exchanges in, in Asia are giving you a, an option to either use GRI or to use their own slimmed down guidelines. My advice to all my clients is don't go with the local slimmed down guidelines. Go straight to GRI. Uh, you may as well get the credibility from, 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 from the outset. And I know I said that GRI is made up of lots and lots and lots of indicators. It's not only about indicators, it's also about, it's also about the approach that you take. So, one of the things that GRI puts a lot of emphasis on is this idea of your management approach. How do you approach the most material issues 
in your organization. So if you're at Heathrow Airport, what is your approach to managing CO2 at Heathrow Airport? Which means managing emissions from your own buildings that you do control, but then trying hard to manage the emissions coming from airlines who you do not control and who are ultimately your customers, uh, of course. Um, so you know, those are the sorts of the, the, those are the sorts of values we have with GRI, not just a set of performance indicators, but going beyond that and getting you to think about the strategic approach you take to dealing with CO2 or dealing with water or dealing with outsourced labour issues or dealing with bribery and corruption, all those uh, all those all those uh, all those sorts of and this is where we are uh, in terms of the uptake of GRI reporting. I think the latest number is something like 3,500 GRI reports worldwide. And I think that's going to shoot up very, very quickly now over the next uh, three or four years with more and more mandatory reporting coming online and people choosing to use the, to use the, 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 the GRI framework. So you know, it's been a... It's been a a, a, a very, very, very steep increase, but there's still an awful lot of companies that are not reporting. Um, you know, the companies that are reporting tend to be the big, big brands and the large listed companies. Uh, in most stock exchanges, you have a number of large listed companies, but then you have 20 times more much smaller listed companies, and there's a sort of long, long tail of much smaller listed companies, and those companies are often not reporting. Of course, if you're not listed, there's no requirement for you to report at all. But again, some of the largest privately held companies are also now um, reporting as well. Um, so even family businesses in Asia, even if they're not listed, they are still seeing the benefits of producing producing reports. What um, the price of a smaller company, even a family company, um, they that think it's fine, they will have to do this, not because of legislative laws or something, but because of the cost of building an exit strategy mm -hmm. for your business. Well, um, in many stock exchanges, you're now faced with having to do it. Um, I, I think, on the other hand, this is a problem um, because I, I, well, in Hong Kong, where I am, we're, we're getting you know, three or four requests a week now from companies who are asking us to help them with their reports. And we're basically saying to them, well, what are you going to report on? And this is a problem because a lot of companies are being told they need to report, but they've not done anything. <laughs> they don't have anything to report on. They, have to, you know, they, 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 don't, they can't measure their CO2, they don't know how to. They don't have any water measures, they've not thought about their outsourced operations, so that, that, that is a problem. But I think you're right. You're, you're, in part, you're being forced to buy legislation or regulation, but I think partly you're being forced to because this will just be peer pressure, this will just be what you do. Well, but the more than that, to do the actual sales Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. for your small business. Yeah. Are these guys going to have to suddenly grab this stuff or the bigger guy that you want to score you up is mm -hmm. not going to do it small? No, that's right. I mean, I, particularly if you're in high-risk sectors. Yes. I think that's true. If you're, if you're in high-risk sectors where you're using a lot of energy, or you're using a lot of water, or you've got significant outsourcing, then you've got to do this. I mean, because it's too risky otherwise. I mean, I, 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 I could never possibly consider buying a company and two weeks after buying it find out that they've got children working in their third tier factories, right? Or they've got slavery in their in, 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 in the fields where and I've just I just bought a company I've just bought a company that's sort of employed slaves. You know? So you're right. I think these companies will have to be able to provide that sort of information, only for due diligence sake. No, no choice, I think, no choice. Um, so just as a, 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 just as a sort of brief overview, this is what GRI looks like. This is the scope of, 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 of GRI. Uh, and it basically says you need to do three things before you even start on giving me numbers. You need to tell me three things. One is 
I want to understand your strategy. What is your sustainability strategy? Um, and companies struggle with this because they're paying, companies are far too fixated on producing a report. They want to see the report. And they want to sort of, yeah, that's, for them that's the end of the process. So the report comes out, it gets delivered from the printer, and you sort of say, well, that's it, job done. I don't have to worry about that for another six months when I have to start the next one. Okay? That's completely the wrong approach. And GRI basically says, yeah, that's the wrong approach. Because the first thing I want you to tell me about actually is your strategy. What are you doing to try and make your company more sustainable? What are you doing to contribute to this broader concept of sustainable development? So you know, what is your strategy? Where are your focus areas? Secondly, tell me about your story of stakeholder engagement and materiality. You know, your report will only get read if people are interested in what you have to say. So you have a vested interest to start from that. What do people want to know about? And again, it's not, it, 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 it's not rocket science, you know? If you're Adidas, I want to know about your factories. If you're Coca-Cola, I want to know about water. If you're Heathrow Airport, I want to know about your carbon emissions. So it, it, it's, it's not rocket science. But you can be even more sophisticated than that by actually asking your stakeholders. And one of the things that we do and we insist on for companies is that whenever you start the reporting process, you go out and you start talking to stakeholders and listening to their concerns and listening to their aspirations. What is it that they expect of your business? And okay, you will get the obvious ones. You'll get the obvious ones around water and emissions, about CO2 and labor standards in outsourced factories. You'll get all those. But sometimes you're quite surprised as well. Sometimes you'll, you'll have someone sort of talking about a local issue often, particularly where, where a business should perhaps have a, have a contribution. And then the third thing you need to talk about, even before you start measuring the numbers, is governance and ethics. How do you ensure that your company is run in a ethical way, in a way that not only manages sustainability, but avoids bribery and corruption. What, um, what, what systems and procedures do you have in place to make sure that decisions are taken that are legal, that are ethical, and that are responsible? And let's face it, we live in Asia. That's not always that easy. Uh, you know, we know that there are major problems with bribery and corruption uh, in this region. Um, but companies, if they are responsible, cannot be doing dodgy deals under the table. Um, you know, there needs to be a degree of accountability for governance and ethics as well. And so GRI asks you to talk about um, how you run your company, uh, how you ensure that your most your highest decision-making authority, which is usually your board, uh, are selected, uh, are managed, and most recently a very interesting debate about women on boards of directors as well, which is a very long and overdue debate uh, in, in, in actual fact. So once you've got those important three things out of the way, then you can start doing the sort of number crunching and the much, much more specific storytelling around your economic performance, and particularly, I think, the contribution you make to local societies. Um, one of the reports that we've done for the last three years has been the Hong Kong Airport Authority's uh, sustainability report. Um, and in that report, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on how the Hong Kong Airport creates value for Hong Kong. You know, it's, a, it's a gateway for passengers. It's a gateway for business travel, it's a gateway for tourism travel, it's a gateway for cargo as well. It's the, it's the biggest cargo airport in the whole of China, interestingly, Hong Kong. So, you know, those economic contributions are often an interesting story to tell. And I think you would all have those stories as well. You know, what is the contribution that you make to Bangkok, to Thailand, to Asia, uh, etc.? And then you have a lot, a lot of indicators on environmental performance. Everything from the sort of big ticket items like carbon dioxide, water, waste, those sorts of issues. 
But interestingly, also issues around uh, biodiversity, uh, conservation, uh, protection of wildlife, those sorts of things, which that may not be relevant to all of you, but it's certainly relevant if you are, for example, working in the agri business sector, if you're a palm oil producer, you better have a story to tell around conservation and, 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 and biodiversity, uh, for, uh, for example. And then there's an area of labor practices and decent work. This means your own labor practices, your own employee employment practices. And some of the indicators, for example, require you to report on uh, employment by gender, employment by duration, so we can see uh, turnover, employment by age, all, all, those, all those sorts of things. But also a lot of emphasis on decent work, particularly when it comes to outsourced labor, you know, are your outsourced workers being treated fairly? Are they being paid properly? Are they being paid on time? Uh, are they working in health, healthy conditions, safe conditions? If they're being provided with dormitory accommodation, is that decent accommodation? Is there hot water? Are there fire extinguishers? All those, all those, all those, all those sorts of things. Uh, and then human rights issues. Um, making sure, for example, that you do not get embroiled in accusations of human rights abuses, everything from child labor, uh, modern day slavery uh, types of issues, but also discrimination against women, against people with disabilities, minority groups, uh, for example. Uh, and then a, a lot of emphasis on your contribution to society through things like your links with communities, the way you invest in communities, um, and last but not least, product responsibility. Um, have you got something interesting to say about the responsibility of your products or how you're trying to improve those products? And if you go and look at the reports of some of the cigarette manufacturers, that's an interesting section. To sort of get them to talk about you know, how they define product responsibility in terms of a a product that ultimately kills you, uh, of course. Um, I'm trying to pick a few contentious ones. Human rights, labor practices. Um, where are you finding your benchmark? Is that in terms of national legislation as well? Or are you trying to uh, impose something uh, for your corporation or something that employs uh, I think what the leading brands are doing often goes way, way beyond, beyond national laws. Um, so, so I always, always see national laws as an absolute minimum. Of course, you, should, you can't call yourself a responsible business and break, break the law. Uh, so for me, that's a minimum. Um, if I was looking at um, um, labor practice and human rights in outsourced supply chains, I would benchmark myself against the biggest brands, the best brands. And for me, the best brands would be Adidas, Disney, um, Nike. Uh, not always uncontroversial brands, actually. I mean, there are, you know, some of them have a history of, of, of a lot of controversy. But again, I would go for the big brands where I think they have done so much work in this area that that's where I would benchmark myself. If, you know, if I was, if I was a, a, a new guy on the block and, and, and and I'd started a new internet startup on, on providing clothing online, I would immediately go to the big, the big guys who've been doing this for 20 plus years. So again, H&M, Adidas, so the, 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 those sorts of people. Um, it's, it's difficult to play catch up with those guys because they are so sophisticated. Um, but that's, that's where I would start, I think. The, the leading brands in whatever sector that is, is, is the benchmark for me. Um, and so, just to give you a taster, I'm not going to go through this, we'll spend a little bit more time on this on, on, on the 4th of July if you choose to come to that one day course. Um, but in each of these areas, you then have a number of, 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 of indicators. So on the economic, you can see it's about your economic performance, but it's also about your indirect economic impact, the contribution that Hong Kong Airport makes to Hong Kong, for example. So, the broader sort of impact of you just being there. On the environmental side, you can see huge amounts uh, of error, and these are often subdivided into further uh, indicators as well. So the, the big issues, 
use of materials, energy, water, but then you get things like biodiversity as well. For many of you, biodiversity might not be that significant, but you know, if you're in agribusiness, it's really significant, uh, of course, so it, it really just depends. Here are the sort of labor practices and decent work issues, which includes not only employment, but things like occupational health and safety issues uh, as, as, as well. Diversity and equal opportunities, equal remuneration for men and women, those, those sorts of issues. Human rights, again, non-discrimination, no child labor, no forced labor, essentially no modern day slavery uh, types of issues. And how you achieve that through things like human rights assessments, Society, again, your, your, your work with local communities, uh, issues around public policy, anti-corruption, the relationship you have as a business with governments, uh, for example. And then product, product responsibility, things like customer health and safety, and I make sure that my, my, my products are not killing people, hopefully, um, or that consumers are at least are aware of the health impacts of, of, of the consumption of certain certain issues. I think this has become a yeah, this has become a huge issue. I think as health and well-being has become more important, and you know, I think companies are increasingly wanting to talk about that product responsibility and you know, what's in my product, and if it's food and beverages, you know, how do I educate consumers about using those products in in, 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 in responsible ways. So that just gives you a sort of flavor of, 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 of some of the issues. And you can see how your report can very easily become 100 pages um, when you start talking about all these things. So the question about achieving the work of the process of the work, um, the balance between inspecting and registering the work of the ads and accepting the idea of the report, is there any general consensus? No. Um, <laughs> No, no, I mean, you, know, you know, you have to see where you are on the journey. Um, yeah, Adidas, Adidas is an interesting company in that you know, they've got some factories that they don't even bother inspecting anymore because they they have shared values. I mean, they, they, they've got they've got factories who they think are just as sophisticated as they are. There's no need to inspect them because they just know these factories are very well run. They they do put human rights and labour practices very high on the agenda. And they're often in the process of actually auditing their suppliers. So we're getting you know, Adidas auditing factories, factories auditing their factories. And so you know, Adidas will tell you that there's some factories they have now that they've not even inspected for three years. They just don't need to. Because they, and that's the way they want to go, to a much, much more shared alignment. Um, yeah, so that I don't constantly have to have this policeman relationship with you. It's a real partnership rather than like, you know, constantly, I mean, inspecting costs so much money. The amount of money these big brands spend on factory inspections is unbelievable. You know, it, it really is. It's, it's quite, quite, quite incredible. I mean, take Disney. It's a great, great Disney's a great organisation. I mean, Disney has so much stuff. It's all the Disney products and some others. So all the Disney technology. You know how many factories Disney has at any point of time? I mean, how many con how many contracted factories has at any point of time? Do you want to have a guess? Well, I had someone say a thousand, but it's a bit more than that. Yeah, it's a lot more than that. At any point in time, Disney has about 13,000 factories. Can you what type of task you have to audit 13,000 factories? It's, I know the guy who heads that function up in Asia, and it's a, it's a big, big, big job. Yeah, well, he's basically not fun. Uh, okay, so anything else about GRI G4? That gives you a little bit of a snapshot. Okay, so the most important thing then I want to concentrate on the last, the last one third of the afternoon is this idea of materiality. So as I said before, if you go through all of this, you're going to end up with a very, very, very long report. Now, you know, there are some companies that probably have significant impact in most of these areas and they're just going to have to have a long report. Hopefully they're going to find other ways of communicating as well. But for most of you, you'll be able to say, well, yeah, some, of the, some aspects of this are really, really important, but actually some aspects are not. So if, I'm a, if I'm an urban property developer, to be honest, biodiversity is not that significant, uh, to, 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 be, to be absolutely honest. If I'm only developing 
properties in the middle of the city, well, you know, the, bi the bindulus is already gone. And I can talk about putting some, some bird houses on the top of my roof if I want to, but to be honest, compared with an agribusiness operation in the middle of Malaysia, my impact on biodiversity is minuscule. So you need to sort of think carefully about which is most important. But you can't just do it at the top of your head. And this is the whole process of materiality. So what, what GRI G4 gives you is an approach to helping you to define what is material and therefore should be included in your report, and what is not material and therefore will probably be left out. Um, so what we're going back to here is the sort of reporting, the, the reporting protest, pr pr process. So if we start thinking about the content of your report, we're thinking about the sort of first half of this as well. So the first thing that, that, that GRI asks you to do is think carefully about your sustainability context. Okay. So what is, what is it that you're doing? So I'll just give you an example of that. You know, an urban property developer versus a big agribusiness operation in the middle of Malaysia. The context is so completely and utterly different. Okay. So the first thing to recognize is, 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 is the context. And then say to yourself, OK, from the top of my head, what are the things that are obviously going to matter? Okay. Large property developer, CO2 emissions, water usage, building materials. If I'm replacing one building with another building, and I take the old one down, what happens to the waste? Those, that's the issue. Okay. If I'm the Malaysian palm oil company, for example, I need to be thinking about land use, I need to be thinking about local communities and access to that land, I need to think about deforestation, I need to think about biodiversity, I need to think about orangutans. The whole, the whole, the whole, the whole context is completely different. Okay? So that's the starting point. What do you do and where do you do it? Okay, so well, what matters and where does it matter is the first sort of thing. Once you've done that, you start need to start thinking about, okay, I then need to start thinking about including my stakeholders and engaging with my stakeholders. What do my stakeholders expect of me? So if I'm an urban property developer versus a Malaysian agribusiness company, I'm going to have very different stakeholders and they're going to have very different things to say. It's the combination of your context and your stakeholder inclusiveness which helps you to define materiality. But that's not the whole process, because materiality needs to be defined by, by, by what you think is important as well. So the whole concept of materiality is partly based on stakeholders and context, but it's also partly based on your priorities as a business as well. Because at the end of the day, you need to make a profit, you need to stay in business, so what's important in the business context is also important in terms of, of, of materiality as well. So part of this process also requires you to think about your strategy. In answer the simple question, why are you in business? And what is the purpose of your business beyond simply making a profit? So we need to sort of put all of this together and start talking about, uh, 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 about uh, uh, materiality. One of the things you might like to think about when you think about your context is things like the Sustainable Development Goals, for example. Um, this, I think, helps you to think about your sustainability agenda. Which of these sustainability goals, for example, would be linked to your core business? Again, it really depends on where you are and, and, and what you're doing. You know, I would argue that any company operating in a developing country, a least developed country, certainly ought to be thinking about sustainable development goal number one, poverty. Um, if you are, if you are uh, using a lot of water in your processes, so if you're a food company, a beverage company, you clearly need to be thinking about water, sanitation issues. And if you are a large fishing company, life below water, sustainability, those sorts of things. So you know, 
here's one way, I think, just one way to look at your sustainability context. Which of those sustainable development goals would be most linked to your, to your business? Interestingly, you know, some of the leading businesses in the world are now sort of almost adopting some of these goals uh, and talking about um, the contributions they can make to achieving some of these goals. So I mentioned Coca-Cola earlier. Um, they're, they're, they're doing enormous amounts of work on sort of clean water, uh, saving water, water management, often at a community level, for, for example. Um, but they're also, interestingly, talking about gender equality as well, and, and women's economic empowerment as well. So the first, the first thing I want you to think about is, you know, what is the context of your business? What is it you do? When, where are you, uh, in actual fact? Uh, and what contributions can you actually, actually make? And then start thinking about, how do I include my stakeholders? This model on the right hand side is a model that I use a lot with businesses, um, which is a process of identifying who your stakeholders are and then prioritizing them because you can't talk to all of your stakeholders unless you've got massive resources. You can't talk to all your stakeholders every year. Um, and then begin to think about how you engage with your stakeholders in order to produce um, reports that will be meaningful to those uh, to those stakeholders. So you know, identify them, prioritize and engage them, map out their concerns, review their concerns, because one of the things I want to remind you of is that your stakeholders are not always right. Um, your stakeholders are sometimes famously wrong. Um, so you need to review what your stakeholders are saying to you and whether that is uh, sensible. Always respond to your stakeholders, either directly or through the sustainability report, and then do the whole thing all over again. The whole point here is we're trying to achieve two important things. Firstly, accountability. GRI asks you to be accountable to your stakeholders. Just, just hang on to that idea for a minute, because the word accountable is actually quite, rather an interesting one. The word accountability is not the same as the word responsibility. The two are often used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be. What's the difference? What's the difference between the word responsibility and the word accountability? It's $10. No. $10 question. Okay. Responsibility is not But accountability, you probably don't have the rules to do it. And you have to be accountable for it. What does it mean, though? Whatever the result is. Yeah, I think partly, partly. I mean, yeah, partly it's about that. Where does the word accountability come from? To account. Account, accountancy, accountant, accountability. They're all they've got the same root root word to account, which means to, to count up, to measure, to prove, to, to assure. You know, that's what accountants do. They prove you really didn't make a profit. Uh, and accountability is about giving me the evidence that you really are responsible. So, so you know, be, you know, I, I would say this, that responsible is doing the right thing, but being accountable is proving it. And so one of the things we want to do is to demonstrate that we really are a responsible business. And that means being accountable to our stakeholders. But it also means being transparent as well. I think a lot of businesses in Asia really struggle with this. It's about saying, here's my business. Um, I will release all the information you need to assess whether I am a responsible, sustainable, ethical business. That doesn't mean I give away my secret recipes. It doesn't mean I give away my technology that gives me that competitive edge. I'm not asking you to give away your competitive advantage, but other than that, I'm asking you to be as transparent to your stakeholders as possible. Why not? Why would you not be transparent? It's a bit like Donald Trump not opening up his tax records. You just know there's something dodgy there, right? <laughs> Otherwise, why wouldn't you open them up? And that's a great 
great example of, 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 of businesses facing the same issues. If you're not going to tell me, have you got something to hide? That's, that's, the, ultimate, that's, the, ultimate, that's the ultimate question. So what's absolutely key to the sort of reporting process is I listen to what my stakeholders have to say. I review what they say. And as far as possible, I am accountable and transparent without giving away those you know, secrets that give me my, 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 my competitive uh, advantage. And then I really need to ask myself the question, okay, which issues am I therefore going to report on? Because if I go back to that table, there are too many issues there. I don't want 100 page, or what I've even seen recently in a couple of Japanese companies is more than 200 pages of sustainability report. I'm not going to read 200 pages of sustainability report. You're not going to read it. They don't know why they're producing it. I think maybe one or two of their investors will read it, but I even doubt that, actually. So, Whilst there are no accepted, there's no generally accepted rules about what should be in and what should be out, um, I think what you have to ask yourself is, hey, what's important to my business in that sustainability context? And what is important to my stakeholders in terms of the industry that I am in or the geographical location or locations? Where I actually, uh, where I actually uh, uh, operate, and if you want to get into really, really difficult areas, what about all your subsidiaries? Do you include them or not? That's really up to you to decide. But if you have a significant, significantly sized subsidiary, then maybe you do 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 do, do include it. It's up to you. You've got a subsidiary that is less than one percent of your turnover. Maybe you put that aside. And if you've got a subsidiary that is one third of your turnover, you probably want to include that. And there might be different issues in your parent company compared with your, your subsidiary. And of course, in Asia, we've got an added complication because so many of our large Asian multinationals are actually conglomerate. A lot of our clients are not operating in one industry at all, they're often operating in six or seven. And they're often quite big players in six or seven actually. Industries. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, shall I do one report per industry? Or shall I do one overarching report which tries to describe all the issues in seven different industries? Again, you have to make that decision. I mean, I can guide you, but ultimately, you as a business need to decide uh, on, 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 that particular, uh, on that particular issue. So, the materiality assessment is the process by which a company determines its most relevant and important sustainability issues to report on. And those two words are important. I want to report on things that are relevant and important. And I need to make that decision by talking to my stakeholders, but also by considering what my business is and what the sustainability context of my business uh, actually is. Uh, actually is. So materiality actually comes from the financial world actually. Uh, materiality is something that accountants have used uh, for a long time uh, in the past and it's the sort of threshold or cut-off point um, between information being not terribly important and significant uh, of course. But in terms of sustainability reporting it really ask you to focus on issues that matter the most. Now, if you come to the conclusion that there are only eight issues that actually matter, for me that's just fine. Eight issues will lead to a very nice, short, tangible, readable report. So let's not get bogged down on numbers. I don't care if you end up with eight material issues or 50 material issues. It's that materiality that will drive readership. If you report on everything, people ain't going to read your report, I can assure you. So be, be focused and ensure that reports are complete. In other words, they do not omit information that your most important stakeholders would expect to see in there. You know, it would be very, very odd for I guess the same example again, a new 
it's so hard for Coca-Cola not to talk about water in it. It would be nonsense. It would be, it would be crazy for an airline not to talk about CO2 emissions. It would be stupid for a palm oil company not to talk about biodiversity. Those are the sort of no-brainers. But the question about materiality is, okay, what else? What else would I want to actually uh, report, uh, report on? So this is the process in which we go through according to GRI G4. One, identify the most relevant issues. That is done by a combination of thinking about your own business and your sustainability context. And talking to your stakeholders about what they think are the most important issues uh, as, 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 as well. And then saying to yourself, okay, which are the most important issues? How do we prioritize those issues? And the thing that G4 requires you to do is have that priority list validated at senior management level. Now this is something that GRI has not had in the past. We didn't have this in G3, but in G4, uh, you are required to demonstrate that your senior management have looked at these priority areas and have agreed that they are the priority areas. And what I usually do is insist that the board do that, or at least a subcommittee of the board do that, so that the chief executive and some of the executive directors of the company have actually looked at what's important and and, and, and thought very carefully about what should be in that sort of materiality um, list, uh, if you like. And then things change, so review regularly. I would go through this process every time I did the report, personally. I would do that materiality assessment at the beginning of each process, which of course is usually these days an, 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 annual, uh, an annual process. So how do I identify which issues to consider? Well, first thing to do, of course, is to make sure that the issues are consistent with your own policies and visions and values. But you also want to start thinking about business risks. So many companies will have a sort of business risk registry. They will have sat down and thought about what are the most significant risks that could be facing their company. So they will have an enterprise risk management approach, hopefully, anyway. Um, but you also want to perhaps track media reports, or have some sort of media tracker or opinion type of tracker, which is what companies like Globescan do so well, uh, for, for example. And you might want to start talking to your customers and employees as well about the issues that they think are, are, are important. So that will give you some sort of internal sort of ideas. But then you'll also have some external references as well, such as laws, regulations in all the countries in which you operate, stock exchange disclosure requirements, we talked about that, that, that earlier. If you want to get on some of these sustainability indices, then you need to have a look at what their requirements are around some of the big, big ticket areas like carbon emissions, water, waste, outsourced labor practices, those, uh, those sorts of things. You can look at um, other sector-specific guidance. One of the things that GRI produces is not only this general guidance, but they also then have sector-specific guidance for a lot, of, a lot of different industry sectors. So um, there is one, for example, for airports. Um, we were, we were involved in that uh, process. There's one in, for agribusiness, there's one for property development, for example. So most significant industry centers have that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, guidance uh, as well. Then you might look at what your peers are doing, and by peers I mean not only perhaps your competitors, but also companies that you feel you'd like to be associated with, companies that you'd like to be respected with. You know? so, looking at the leading companies on the sustainability agenda. And you might also look at things like relevant NGO campaigns as well. So who's saying what about what types of, uh, of issues uh, at the moment, for example. So 
you know, modern slavery has become a big, big issue over the last couple of years. Um, and that's something that you certainly want to think about if you're involved in agribusiness or, or fishing or those sectors where we're seeing a lot of abusive slave-like uh, slave -like conditions. And this is the process of prioritization. Okay? Basically, using this matrix here, I want to map out issues that are important to stakeholders on this axis and issues that are important to business uh, on this axis uh, here. So issues are important to stakeholders if it affects the stakeholders' assessment of your company, it affects the decisions or behavior of stakeholders towards your company, or is simply something that stakeholders feel should be disclosed. And then issues are important to business if there is an impact on the company's ability to fulfill its mission and objectives, if there is a potential impact on your operations and long-term development, if there are direct financial implications, positive or negative, or if there are risks or opportunities to the company. But some of you may have seen this matrix with actually issues plotted on it. So some of the things that some businesses have done is actually take this matrix and then actually plot issues onto the matrix. The point of doing that is to say, okay, we then need to prioritize the issues that are in the top right-hand corner. These are the material issues. In other words, by definition, the most material issues are the issues that are important to my stakeholders and important to my business. That's what I should prioritize. There are some issues that are important to my stakeholders, but not important to me. Okay, I should acknowledge that. I should make sure I have policies in those areas so that I can just inform my stakeholders what I'm doing. There are sometimes issues that are really important to your business but your stakeholders don't care about. Well, I think the importance here is just to explain why some of these things are important to your business. So you may or may not report issues in these areas, depending on your judgment. But if there are issues down here, if there are issues down in this bottom left-hand box, Issues that are not important to your business and not important to stakeholders, why would you even bother discussing them? And yet, guess what? I see it all the time. I see companies, particularly the companies with the 100 plus page reports, talking about things that are really not interesting to their stakeholders and are really not important to their business. You're just wasting your time. On the G4, is it mandatory to report this scoping the screening process as well? Yes, yes. So under G4, you were talking about your materiality process. How did you determine the materiality? And what is becoming very popular is something like this matrix appearing in your report. Um, some companies have done it in a sort of four, uh, two by two matrix. Some, some companies have done it in sort of diagonal sec sections. Some companies have done it through sort of arches. It doesn't matter. The, it doesn't matter quite how you do it, but the most important principle is this is what you report on. Issues that are important to you as a business and issues that are most important to your stakeholders. Notwithstanding the fact that this needs senior management engagement as well. And one of the things that we've been doing for some of our clients is often is actually presenting that matrix to senior management with the different issues plotted on it. Um, I, I, I recently did some work for a construction company um, and <coughs> occupational health and safety uh, appeared on this matrix uh, sort of here. So occupational health and safety was really, really important to the business, but actually was not mentioned by that many stakeholders. And the senior management, their reaction was, well, it's, that's ridiculous, that's ridiculous. Well, you know, we are a construction company. We must report on occupational health and safety. So although it was here and not here, 
nevertheless, they said, we, we must report on that. And that, that's the senior management process. So they can say, you know, it would be ridiculous for a construction company not to talk about health and safety, not to talk about you know, site safety and, and, and accidents and things, and things like that. So you know, that, that's why that senior management sort of engagement is, 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 is quite important. And then that's what I've come on to now. So you, you present this to senior management. Senior management have exactly that discussion saying, yes, we agree. You know, let's add some extra emphasis to certain, uh, certain uh, 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 issues. Um, <coughs> and to answer your question, GRI says that there must be a statement from the most senior decision making of the organization about the relevance of sustainability in the organization which means how they have gone through the organization's strategy for addressing sustainability issues. One of the things that I have learned over many, many years is that senior management will often listen to external consultants more than their own staff. Um, it's true, it shouldn't be true, but it is. And so I mean, one of the things I find myself in the position of doing is being wheeled out in front of the board uh, to say, you know, Guys, this is really, really important. You know, what your sustainability managers have been telling you for the last five years really is important. And you, know, you get the ear of the chief executive, and then things things happen. But that's that's just that's just that's just uh, uh, relatively. And lastly, review because this is an iterative process. Um, you know, things do come and go. Things, you know, I often say social responsibility is a little bit like the fashion industry. Um, you know, issues do come and go, issues become highlighted by NGOs sometimes. In modern day slavery is, I think at the moment, one of those big hot issues that, that everybody is, 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 is talking about. So materiality is influenced by trends, by the media. You know, I mean, that, the modern day slavery issue, I think, has been influenced a lot by people like CNN and the Guardian newspaper in the UK who have great investigative journalism around uh, slave-like conditions in the fishing industry, uh, for example. You don't have to do this every year, but personally I would. I, I, I think uh, it's worth doing it. Whenever I do a, a stakeholder engagement, I usually find out something that I didn't otherwise know, or a concern that I didn't quite uh, understand. Um, and you should engage your stakeholders every year, but not necessarily the same ones. Uh, and I find it quite useful sometimes just to mix it up a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things we've done for one of our clients in Hong Kong just the last two weeks is engage a group, a specific group that we haven't engaged before, which is actually young people. And uh, we've had two focus groups of people who are under 25. And that has been so useful, um, particularly in the whole context of Hong Kong where we had young people occupying the streets for a couple of months last year. Um, you know, young people are huge influence of, influences of public opinion these days. You know, because of Facebook and Instagram and all the online stuff. Um, and so we decided this year for this one client of ours to actually engage under 25 year olds. And what they had to say was so different to other stakeholders. It's just, 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 I really was scratching my head at the end of the day thinking, you know, we have, a, we have a group of young people now who are, simply have completely different aspirations to at least my generation. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with those sorts, of, uh, those sorts of issues. And then as I said before, one of the things that G4 puts a lot of emphasis on is management approach. Um, so how do you explain and manage your most material impact? Um, and, 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 and one of the things that GRI asks you to do, therefore, is not only talk about indicators, but talk about the approach to what your big ticket items are, whether that's climate change and CO2 emissions, whether that's outsourced labor, whether that's modern day slavery, how are you actually managing uh, that, 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 that approach? And tell the story of how you identified those issues and ultimately what you're doing about it, what, 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 what gets done. And so usually in the, in the management approach, you talk about your strategy, specific policies you might have around environmental issues or labor issues, outsourced supply chains, 
the commitment of your management, specific goals and targets, um, whose responsibility is it for dealing with these particular issues, what resources are needed for dealing with those issues, and what specific actions you would undertake. So for each of your most material issues, you will have a management approach. And that's why some reports get very, very long. <laughs> because we are talking not only about our performance, but how we manage these particular issues and perhaps some of the specific, specific things that we, we do to deal, uh, to deal with them. And then targets are key. Um, you know, I push my clients all the time to think about targets. They're often quite resistant to targets, particularly in the early days, because they're always frightened of failure. Uh, companies hate not meeting their targets, uh, of course, but that's because they don't define them terribly well. But ask yourself for each material area, is there a quantifiable indicator that you need to set as a target? The environmental areas lend themselves better to this. Because I can talk about percentage reduction in CO2, percentage reduction in water usage, percentage reduction in waste, all those sorts of things lend themselves to numbers. When it comes to um, labor issues, sometimes it's more difficult. Labor, human rights issues, community issues, it's a bit more difficult. So, in those sorts of areas where you could be questioned or criticized, maybe you need much more of a sort of process target. Uh, so we are committed to treating our workers in such and such a way, um, you know, rather than saying we will have a percentage of workers who, well, what? What would that percentage be of what issue? You know, I mean, so some of the social indicators don't lend themselves so easily to quantitative targets, but we can talk about qualitative targets, process targets, uh, for, uh, for example. And the ultimate question I would have to all of you is, when it comes to things like selecting targets, how would you convincingly show to your stakeholders that you are making progress, that you are improving? Again, on the environmental side, you know, numbers are quite easy. On the social side, you know, I can measure things like reductions in complaints, reductions in grievances, reduction in maybe turnover of my staff. But beyond that, I'm probably going to look for more qualitative types of um, types of uh, types of, 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 of targets. Um, I won't go through this in, 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 in a lot of detail, but this is a, an example from Verizon, from their sustainability report, um, where you can see a mixture of those numbers um, in terms of quantities and some more qualitative improvements. So again, you know, I can reduce my carbon intensity by 50%, and that's quite a bold target, but it's, but it's achievable. Uh, but then when it comes to things like um, certification, I can talk about receive energy star certification on 90% of all eligible retail stores. Um, for my retail stores, either uh, 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 the B status for, uh, for green stores, for example. Um, modify all accessory packaging to only use paper content that is recycled or come from responsible sources. Devote 40% of our suppliers to their lending with firms that measure and set targets themselves. So you, you can have a look at that. It's just, just an example of sort of you know both very specific number targets, but also process uh, process types of targets as uh, as, 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 as as well. Uh, again, this, this 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 goes back to Swire. Again, if you have got numbers. It lends itself to some very nice, easy presentation. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, uh, water consumed. You know, you'll find lots and lots and lots of examples of these types of metrics around, uh, uh, around targets. But I think the most important thing to always remember goes back to where we started, which is remember that reporting 
should be a process linked to your strategy. And please, please, please don't think about the reporting process as ending up with the report. You know, the report ought to be in the middle. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, what goes around the report that is really, really important, the front end is all about uh, you know, materiality and sustainability context. The other end is all about brand and reputation and communications. You know, the, the, the report, if you like, is the foundation on which you should be building this strategy, which is about brand, reputation, trust, making better and informed decisions, uh, stimulating organizational development, driving better performance, engaging stakeholders, and ultimately getting new investment uh, as, 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 as well. So, a couple of questions to you in the last 10 minutes that we have. Uh, what's your takeaway today? How many of you have started reporting? What's your next steps of your reporting journey? Because I would encourage you all to start this very soon if you haven't done already, because you're going to, force, you're going to be forced into doing it sooner or later, actually. So you may as, may as well have to start. Uh, I'm curious about the history of the evolution. The whole process started in 77, and then uh, I noticed that it took you two years before the first report came out, and it's an evolution, of course. Yeah. But then you mentioned about the market uh, driven, basically stock market uh, uh, enforcement. Um, here in Thailand, we already started the enforcement with the 56.1, reports, and then some of them the ESG and also the SD and also the GI, of course. But then it doesn't work this way. It doesn't work this way at all because the compliance issue. Uh, most of the Thai, especially the listed companies, they are they they start with compliance and they start with the investment opportunity. So they're looking at a big report, as you mentioned. You know, in, in fact, it's even bigger than the annual report. And then, uh, and then when it, you, you start to talk to, for example, like me, I start to talk to my clients about this sustainability strategy. Yeah, that strategy is to output that report. <laughs> so it, it, it's so hard to uh, to see the real things happening, you know, the process, the yeah. battle. Yeah. So uh, I'm just curious about the learning process or the, the lesson learned from you know like Hong Kong or or, other, or Singapore or, or some other uh, important markets. How they uh, handle the enforcement? They have to do bit by bit. So you know, like in Thailand, you start from my incentive for the practice. 56, 1, 56, 2 reports, and then you have a governance scorecard and things like that. But how long would it take? I think they're still learning. I mean, I, I, I mean, if you look at Hong Kong, which is probably reasonably sophisticated within Asia, we have 80 companies, oh, sorry, we have 80% of the Hang Seng Index with sustainability reports. Now, that might sound impressive, but remember the Hang Seng Sustainability Index only has 50 companies. <laughs> so we have 40 out of the top 50 companies with a sustainability report, but we've got 1,500 other listed companies with no sustainability report. So we've learned a lot from the biggest listed companies. I'm playing wait and see about how these smaller listed companies are going to report, because all of them have nothing to report on. They're not done with them. So I think we've learned quite a lot. We've learned, as you said, this has to be about the process, not about the report. That is very clear in my head. And, you know, I, I don't much like having relationships with clients anymore that are about writing their report. Because it's, it, that's a one-off job, which means the end of your contract is when you produce the report. And that's the wrong approach. So, so I'm, pushing, I'm push, pushing the rest of my clients now into giving us two, three-year contracts. And that it becomes a process and not a one-off. They can get out any time they want it. We do a bad job, of course. But I don't want, you know, we're too fixated on the report being the end of the process. And, and that's completely the wrong approach. Um, that's, 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 that's the big learning. And I think the second big learning that we're going to have to get to grips with is that people are not reading them. <laughs> they are not reading reports. Or at least what we know is they're not reading them cover to cover. Most of the evidence suggests that very few people start on page one and then go on page whatever the end is. 
Uh, but people selectively look at reports. So one of the one of the companies that's been really good at reporting in Hong Kong has been CLP, the big, the big, big utility company, the big electricity utility company in Hong Kong. And they, they put their sustainability report online and then they started tracking quite so, in a sophisticated way where the hits were going and where they were coming from. And people were generally using keyword searches. So most people were going, okay, I want to know what CLP is doing in terms of CO2 emissions, or I want to know what CLP is doing to offset its biodiversity losses because they have a lot of land for cables and things like that. So, so that indicated to me that, again, people are often interested not in the whole of your sustainability performance, but actually in one aspect. So I'm a water guy, or I'm a CO2 guy, or I'm a biodiversity guy. If I'm interested in biodiversity, I'm not interested in your CO2. So we need to package it up better. So you can still have a sustainability report for those few people who do want to read page one to page 100. But I think we're going to see much, much reporting online, searchable. An online report does not have to be annual anymore. It could be updated more often than that if you wanted to. There are some bits of your report that don't change that much, and they could just be fixed. The governance bit, to be honest, for most companies, governance doesn't change that much year on year. So that could be sort of fixed. So we're having to think about new things. Plus, you know, the one thing I learned from these focus groups for these young people is actually they want pictures, they want diagrams, they want stuff that they can send to their friends on Facebook or Instagram and whatever of these other things that they use that I've never heard of. Um, you know, we, need to find it, we need to find a way to much better communicate what we're doing, which is why that Heathrow Airport diagram is so great. You know, you've got a diagram that shows where the emissions are coming from, how much of it is the airport itself, the fact that the bulk of it is actually other, other companies, which are the airlines that fly in and out of the airport. So, we need to find cleverer ways to report in, in future. So that, that's, that's one of my big lessons. Yeah, Richard, just following on from, uh, from that Thailand and how it's quite, you know, we're, we're, we're here at the moment, where some of the leaders are, yeah. and they're doing great things. In Thailand, are there any examples of companies who are doing great reporting on this? So, what's the baseline? We're all looking for someone that compares with. Um, I guess SCG, I mean, I guess some of the, these companies that everyone, it's the same, same old suspects, unfortunately, you know? I mean, it's the same in Hong Kong and Singapore too, SCG, PTT, these guys have been doing it for, for a while, and they're, they're good, um, but as with most other places, it's, it's the next tier down that we need to sort of push in the right direction. Um, I think there's also some very bad reports around, um, I see some very thin reports with no targets, I think the way you define, the way you design your report says something about your understanding of sustainability. And I'm sick to death of seeing sustainability reports based on trees and flowers and dolphins okay. and hearts. And the next time I see a heart around a sustainability report, I think I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> this is just not where, the, this is completely the wrong message. Sustainability is not a nice thing to do. It should be part of your business strategy. And trees and flowers and dolphins and hearts are just completely the wrong message to, 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 to me. Um, yeah, uh, probably the same um, question or heading up to the question as he said before. Um, if I remember correctly, in the beginning, mm -hmm. you said GRI reporting is already applied in Europe roughly below 60%. Asia was 0.8%. So, two questions. Um, how quickly do you see improving Asia? And the second is, why should they? What 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 would what, what drive them? What would be their motivation? Um, I think Asia is playing catch up, particularly China. We're seeing a lot of change now in China. We're seeing the government pushing the agenda in China. Um, I think the investors are expecting just as high standards in the future as this business China. What would make the Asian companies do this? Well, I think I think a bit of regulation. Uh, that, will, that, that will make them do it. I mean, again, we've seen that in China. I mean, the, the, the Chinese government, even I think about eight years ago now, mandated all state-owned enterprises to do sustainability reports because they have control of them, of course. So, so that helps. But look, I think at the end of the day, it's also about brand and reputation and trust. 
And when I'm talking to large Asian conglomerates these days, they sort of understand that. Because um, I, I talk to large Asian companies who really no longer want to be Asian. Because they've got global domination on their mind. And particularly some of the big Chinese companies. And I think about you know, companies like, okay, I've had this conversation with China Mobile. China Mobile says they don't want to be Chinese anymore. Um, they want to be global. They want to be AT&T, they want to be O2, they want to be British Telecom. You know, they, they, want to be a, they want to be just as global as these other players are. And what they realize is they can only get into these Western markets if they are responsible. So unless they can demonstrate a degree of sustainability and social responsibility, governments will keep them out. So they understand that, I think. So I think the pressure is coming internationally, but then there's regulatory pressure coming locally. And I think it depends on country to country. The environmental pressure coming from the Chinese government is now enormous. I mean, not only regulations, but naming and shaming companies that pollute rivers. I mean, that's, that was, the last two years has been phenomenal now. The government has encouraged the media, complete U-turn, but now encouraging the media to reveal companies in China that are really bad polluters. So I think, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. Okay, I think that it will, it will change very rapidly. How rapidly? Well, I think 10 years. 10 years will be in Asia where we are in Europe now, which is not that long. Okay, well, it's exactly 3 o'clock, so I think we need to draw things to a close, because many of you probably still have things to do and places to go. So thank you very much for joining with me. This was just a snapshot, so if you do want uh, the whole day of this with a few more exercises and a few more case studies, then Please join us in July. Fifth of July, not the fourth. I'm getting confused with fourth of July. Fifth of July. Fifth of July. Uh, July. Good to see some of you uh, to come. So please, there's a little evaluation form I think for you to fill in. Please take the flyer with you. Ask your colleagues to come. Hopefully, we'll see some of you again. Thank you very much.